The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship on this summer Sunday, this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We begin our worship with our confession of sin and the assurance of pardon. We'll begin with a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray together. Beloved and sovereign God, may we pray for an understanding mind and ability to discern between good and evil. May we rejoice in the love of Christ that is stronger than all rulers and powers, things present and things to come, stronger even than death itself. May we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the holy name of Jesus, and through the power of the Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 1 King, chapter 3, verses 5 to 12. Because Solomon did not ask for long life, riches, or the defeat of his enemies, 
God gave him what he asked for, wisdom to govern the people well. A reading from 1 Kings. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart before you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. This is the word of God, word of life. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 8. These words celebrate the depth of God's actions for us. Through Christ's death for us and the activity of the Spirit praying for us, we are fused to God's love poured out in Christ Jesus. Nothing, not even death itself, is able to separate us from such incredible divine love. A reading from Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs so deep for words, and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for, the, for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn with a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then 
are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us <clears throat> will not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is con to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus continues with a series of parables about the Kingdom of Heaven. Jesus is piling them on, parables about a sower of seed, a woman baking bread, a fortune seeker, a merchant, a commercial fisher. Parables that describe God's universal, though often hidden, presence in the world. Parables that describe the Kingdom of Heaven as emerging from something small, practically invisible, but growing exponentially. Parables that invite us into wonder and discovery. Wonder and discovery about God's presence in the world and in our lives. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in the branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of our Lord. Good morning. Welcome to my kitchen. We're going to do a special project here this morning. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. This is what yeast looks like. Sometimes it comes in bags too. And yeast does something very surprising 
to bread. And we're going to see how Jesus says that we can look at the bread and think about how God surprises us in the world, how God does good things and surprising things. So I'm going to take a cup of warm water and I'm going to put two and a half, two and a half teaspoons of yeast into it. And a little bit of olive oil. So I added some olive oil and I added some honey. This is honey that is from one of my neighbors who has a beehive in his backyard. And the recipe that I'm making is one that Pastor Juliet shared with me. So I have lots of friends who have been helpful. But something else that Jesus likes is when we help each other. And I've added some salt and some flour. And I'm mixing this up really nicely. And then I'm going to start adding some more flour. And we'll keep mixing and we'll need to use a wooden spoon. Okay, I added the rest of the flour and mixed it with the spoons. And then I cleaned my counter again and washed my hands again. And now we need, we need this flour, this dough, which has yeast that is hidden in it. I can't get it out anymore. It's hidden in here, dissolved in the water, but even though we can't see it or get it out, it's going to do something very special. And when we see that happen, we'll be able to think about why Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God being like yeast. So I have my dough ball here that I've been kneading, and it's not that big and it doesn't look that special. I'm kind of curious what Jesus was talking about. How is this going to help us think about the kingdom of God? I don't know, but we're going to put it on the counter for now. I'm going to press it down a little bit and I'm going to cover it up and go do some other projects and we'll check in on it later. How's that sound? Let's just take a peek here. It's getting a lot bigger, and I'm going to pull that out and divide it, divide it into four. And we'll shake them a little bit. And then we will let them rise a little bit more. So we're going to take another look. Here's what the yeast has done. The surprise is working and we are ready to put these loaves of bread in the oven now. Here's the bread out of the oven. Four small loaves. Um, the best part is yet to come because our family will be able to eat bread. And I would love to share the recipe with you if you can make some with your mom or dad or a grandparent. And you know, before eating the bread, I'm gonna pray, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let these gifts to us be blessed. But I'll be thinking about Jesus's words about how the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which is in all of the bread, in all of the dough. There's no dough that doesn't have yeast in it here. And that gets me thinking how Jesus is in all the world. The kingdom of heaven is all around us, everywhere in the world. That's the good news for today. God bless you. Let us pray. O oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. First Kings invites us to take a look back, to look back at another time, another ruler who sought to govern well, and for whom that meant beginning in prayer before God. I'm talking about Solomon, 
who succeeded his father, David. Solomon here in today's reading is inspiring. Why? Because he sees himself as servant. In talking to God, he refers to himself as your servant. You have made your servant king in place of my father, David. He's humble, referring to himself as a little child with much to learn. He is open to advice. He's asking for help so that he may govern well. His repeated focus is on the well-being of the people and not his own glory, power, or wealth. Each week in our prayers of intercession, we have a petition for those who are governing. Solomon's prayer can offer us guidance as we pray for our political leaders. Something else that is both interesting and relevant about Solomon's prayer is that it marks a time of transition between rulers and generations. Solomon is able to speak well. He's able to both speak well of his father, David, and to acknowledge the need in a new time and a new place for discernment of what is right. The phrase discern what is right, literally be translated from the Hebrew, literally means to hear justice. He asks God to help him hear justice. God, I need you to help me to hear justice. This is an opportunity for the next generation to say, I want the wisdom of God so I can see and do justice. That, I suggest, is as pertinent today as it was in Solomon's time. Luther Seminary's professors Rolf Jacobson and Matt Skinner suggest that another way this biblical text speaks to us is by not narrowly viewing it only as a prayer of King Solomon or of a political leader, but by putting ourselves in Solomon's place. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve acquire the ability to know the difference between good and evil. Now, you and I are well aware that knowing the difference between good and evil and always choosing what is good and avoiding the evil are two different things. We may know what is right and still not always choose it. In fact, for Solomon, he will later in his life succumb to many temptations and ultimately fail to utilize the wisdom that God has made available to him. So there is something cautionary, too, for us when this becomes our prayer, as we pray that we might individually and together as church, discern and courageously do justice. I think it's one of the gifts of being church together is that we can discern what to pray and how to pray better than we can alone. We can do this better together. If First Kings invites us to take a look back and find new meaning in an old prayer, the gospel invites us to look forward and all around as we discern the presence of the kingdom of God. Jesus piles on parable upon parable as he invites us to pay attention, to pay attention to life and the people around us and the kingdom of God, both visible and mysterious in those people and that life all around us. This gospel is really a summer preaching series unto itself. This morning, I will, however, focus on just one of these kingdom parables. I'll focus my attention on the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. There are some fairly obvious themes that provide good food for thought. This parable, like the mustard seed, is a parable of growth. The kingdom of heaven is all about God in the small that grows really big. The kingdom of heaven is about the insignificant that proves to be most significant. The seemingly invisible that becomes very visible. There is growth and transformation. There's something hidden about the kingdom of God. We don't usually see yeast doing its thing. There's something surprising. As I pointed out during the gospel reading, 
Jesus utilized scenarios with ordinary people in diverse socioeconomic settings for his parables. Sower of seed, a fortune seeker, a merchant, a commercial fisher, and here a woman baking bread. And yet there's a twist. We're drawn in and then there's something surprising, a discovery. Again, I am indebted here to the writings of the Episcopal priest, Robert Farrar Capon. His book on parables was published in the mid eighties, but many of his biblical insights, I think, have enduring relevance. Be sure to notice here that the surrogate for God, the description of God is a woman, a woman who's baking bread. Nothing gourmet about this, just plain bread she's baking and a lot of it. In Capon's delightful words, this is not a woman making a mere two loaves for her husband, but this is a baker, folks. Three measures is a bushel of flour for crying out loud. That's 128 cups. That's 16 five pound bags. And when you get done putting in the 42 or so cups of water that you need to make it come together, you've got a little over a hundred pounds of dough on your hands. And all of it is leavened. I don't want to over explain the parable. Today's parables are not so much riddles to be solved or allegories to be explained as they are picture images or story vignettes designed to awake a sense of wonder in us, a sense of discovery. Some explanation, however, can help awake that wonder. So when Jesus says the whole of this tremendous amount of flour is leavened, the lump of dough may represent the world. Capon says a large lump of dough, indigestible in its present form, unwieldy, difficult to manage or handle. Sounds like the world, doesn't it? The whole of it leavened. Capon speaks of the Catholicity of the kingdom as he reflects on this. And when he refers to Catholicity, you might think of the Apostles' Creed, where we say week after week, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, meaning the Holy Universal Church. So to speak about the Catholicity of the kingdom is to say that as all of the dough is leavened, so God's presence is in all of the world. The kingdom of heaven is present everywhere, but present in a mysterious, hidden way. If you watch my online children's sermon where I, where I bake bread, I dissolve yeast in water, and once I do so, you can no longer see the yeast. Once the yeast is mixed in with the flour and, and it becomes a dough, you can't extract the yeast. You can't see it or take it out. And Capon suggests that's like Jesus in the world. We don't always see him, but he's always been there, always been hidden in his creation, did not start being hidden in 4 BC when we celebrate his birth in Bethlehem, but has been there from the very beginning and in 4 BC, all he did in his time on earth was show us his face and tell us his name and send us out to share the good news with everybody. You might hear a challenge in, a, in the parable, a calling for Jesus's original disciples and now a calling for you and for me to be like yeast in the world. Or you may hear the parable simply as good news. This baker is doing her glorious thing, lightening the dough with yeast. There's the promise that Jesus will likewise lighten the burdens that we may bear, the tasks to which you and I are called. Our job then is to be patient while the yeast does its thing and to be attentive, to be attentive to when the dough is done rising and when the bread is done baking. In other words, to let God do God's work in and through us. And then, as Capon says, to listen for the divine woman baker to look at us and to say, now that's what I call a real loaf of bread. Thanks be to God. Amen.
God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying. Confident of your care, O Holy One, and moved by your Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things, a mustard shrub, a woman baking bread, a fishing net. Help us, your people and your church, to witness to the surprising yet common ways you are visible to us in daily life. Lord of life, hear our prayer. Your word gives light and understanding. Increase our respect and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers. Treasuring the earth, may we live as grateful and healing caretakers of your wondrous creation. Lord of life, hear our prayer. As birds find shelter in branches of trees, Gather the nations of the world into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Inspire leaders of nations to build trust with each other and walk in the way of peace. We pray especially for cooperation in the pandemic, that there may be an abundance of compassion, accessible health care, and progress in creating a vaccine for the world to share. Lord of life, hear our prayer. Your spirit helps us in our weaknesses and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to those who are opposed, and healing to the sick, especially Kathy Carpenter and John Stendhal. Lord of life, hear our prayer. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation see what is most needed now and then. Help us ask boldly for it. Refresh us with new dreams of being your people in this place and time. Lord of life, hear our prayer. And now I leave some silence where we can all offer our own intercessions in the privacy of your home or wherever you are, the privacy of your heart. We pray. In you, dear Lord, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by the inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. Embolden our witness now, and one day gather us with all your saints in light. We especially now remember and hold up the family and friends of Fran Belter and Leanne Sissel. Lord of life. Hear our prayer. 
In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, dear God, we offer these prayers to you in the name of Jesus and through your most Holy Spirit. And may we all say, Amen. The challenges before us are to be servants of God, to be humble, to discern right from wrong, to hear and do justice, to seek the common good. The good news is that we do not do this work alone. Like the yeast that leavens dough, Jesus Christ is present. The kingdom of heaven, though hidden, is already here. The good news is that nothing, 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 not hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, COVID, racism, sexism, anything present or to come will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go forth with the blessing of this good news, the blessings of this love, the blessings of Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.